I'm Charles Brock, and I'm a Highland Woodworker. Coming up, a Rubo workbench top from the bottom up. Then, get an overview of the safest table saw on the market. This one is just a quarter inch masonite, drywall screws, of course, and a one by four. Chris Schwartz gets jiggy. See how something plain simple can improve your work. Plus, master chair maker Jeff Miller. There was this sense that I'm gonna make this and I'm gonna make it something that I like. Get an exclusive look at his next project inside his Windy City workshop. Shh, the Wood Whisperer has something to say and why we think you should listen. These stories and more, this time on the Highland Woodwork. I'm at Highland Woodworking. Woodworkers from all over the world have come to rely on Highland Woodworking for their fine tool and woodworking resources. A Rubeau workbench is made with long, heavy slabs of wood. Let's visit with a company that's making the new Highland Woodworking Rubeau workbench tops. Start in Atlanta, Georgia, and we're going to find out how the big boys plane, joint, glue up and make these large wood panels, especially for the new Highland Woodworking Rubo Bench Tops for your workbench. This is Lisa Vieira. Hello, Lisa. Hi there, Chuck. I understand you're going to take us on a tour. I am. Well, let's get started. So Jack is now selecting the lumber that we'll be using for the bench tops. He's looking for grain consistency, color consistency, and um, overall look of the top. Right now he's putting it through the, the sander so that we have a nice smooth top. This machine has two sanding heads. We're sanding this with a 100 and a 120 grit sink. So you get this nice job. smooth finish. Do this kind of work, you have to have a straight cut. You do have to have a straight cut so that it's ready for the glue. Except the glue, and you get a great, strong, long term glue sink. Lifetime glue sink. a lot of tension to the detail. So the glue is applied and rolled for a good tight bond. All right, so here's where the pressure is applied. The bar on top will keep the top flat and the sides will push together. And you'll see now they're applying pressure from the side also, and you'll see the glue will creep out here. So that's why there's not much of a need for an overkill on glue. Sure. But there will be a bond, both sides are. I'd like to have this in my shop.
That's two dominoes. So that will provide the alignment necessary so that there will be a, a flat surface. That is exactly what it is. Well, we're at the stroke sander for some final sanding. Make sure everything is just as smooth and flat as it can be. Because a workbench top has to be smooth and flat. Look at that maple shine. That is just a great finish there on that bench. I think Andre Rubeau would just love to have this bench in his shop. It's a beautiful workbench top, and I know I'd love to have it in mine. Lisa, thank you so much. You're so welcome. We were glad to have you, Chuck. We enjoyed the tour. It was a lot of fun. Every good workshop has to have a table saw. Use correctly a table saw and a joiner and a planer what you need to dimension the lumber that you'll need for almost every fine woodworking project. Well, SawStop has made selection of a table saw easy. For ease of use and performance alone, SawStop has mastered the table saw details. The dust collecting blade guard makes a tool-free swap with the riving knife, which is essential when ripping. The zero clearance table saw insert locks in and snaps out to open up the saw's cavity for changing blades. Toolless reassembly is easy and the guard and insert provide solid, level, safe supports for all your saw cuts. The T-square style fence provides accuracy and stability for your ripping cuts. Press the handle down to bring the fence to square and then lock it in place and you're ready to rip. With a dust collector and the blade guard in place, a saw stop collects 99% of the dust. It is engineered just to pull it right through the saw. The way the cast iron table and wings line up and the fit and finish of the saw stop in general will make you smile. But the number one reason you should buy a saw stop is safety. Roy Underhill demonstrates this feature using a fried chicken leg. No, it won't cut a chicken leg, and it won't cut your skin either. Your loved ones will appreciate the peace of mind that a saw stop table saw will bring to your woodworking experience. Coming up next, we're headed to Popular Woodworking Magazine's workshop. Hand tool expert Chris Schwarz shows me his quick and easy workbench workarounds. Then we're visiting chairmaker Jeff Miller Watch the magic unfold as he builds upon an old idea. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. Saw Stop is the only table saw that stops on contact with skin. Its safety features and unmatched quality and craftsmanship have made it the best selling cabinet saw in America. Order a Saw Stop Professional Cabinet Saw from Highland Woodworking in March or April of 2013 and choose either one of these two accessories for free. That's a $199 extra value. Put a Saw Stop in your shop. Do you need wood? Then go nowhere but Bell Forest Products. Come stand in awe of our 20,000 square foot showroom that houses over 75 species of exotic wood, the largest in the Midwest. What more could you want? A knowledgeable staff? Well, come in and speak to one of these handsome young men because they know wood. They breathe wood. They eat wood. They live wood. They love wood. They are wood. So plan your adventure to Bell Forest Products, 200 East Hematite Street, downtown Ishpeming, or visit us online at bellforestproducts.com. Because we got wood. Are your tools Tormek sharp? 
Tormek, consistent, reliable, and razor sharp. Tormek, sharpening innovation. Bessie, a leader in clamps since 1936. If you know clamps, you know Bessie. Bessie, simply better. Forest, manufacturer of the award-winning Woodworker II presents the PVW blade, designed specifically for the rip and cross-cutting of plywood and plywood veneers without splintering or chip outs. Highland Woodworking has been a leader in woodworking education for over 30 years. They offer all kinds of woodworking classes year-round, ranging from how to hand cut dovetails and mortises to how to sharpen a plane or a chisel, how to build a cabinet, a chair, or a bookcase, or how to turn a wooden bowl. There are classes on wood finishing, French polishing, and even antique furniture restoration. For a list of upcoming classes that may interest you, go to highlandwoodworking.com. Highland Woodworkers are found all over the world. Email a picture of you and your woodworking project along with your name and where you live to picture at thehighlandwoodworker.com. You might be a redneck if you build one of Chris Schwar's unique planing jigs. Let's learn how with Popular Woodworking's tips, tricks, and techniques. Chris, hand tool woodworking, I think, requires a lot of jigs. Do they all have to be fancy? Absolutely not, Chuck. Um, I'm going to show you here today uh, my what I might call my redneck jigs. And right. uh, I'm you know, from Arkansas, so I'm allowed to call them redneck jigs. Well, I'm from Georgia. I understand. You yes. probably have a few then. So uh, <laughs> what we got here, this is a planing stop. And unlike a really fancy blacksmith planing stop, this one is just a quarter inch masonite, drywall screws, of course, and a one by four screwed together in an L shape. And what this planing jig allows you to do is work without a tail vise. We, don't, we can plane entire wide panels here by just buttoning it up against the, uh, the masonite and uh, then we can just plane right against it and we can plane really, really thin stock, which is one of the downsides of uh, planing against dogs. Sure, and it's simple. Yeah, it's totally simple. And then it's, it's also great because you can rotate it up a little bit and then you can plane the thick stock. So you can do you can you can get it up almost six inches off the bench, and it's only two pieces of wood, and you got you pretty much don't have to use the tail vise. That's wonderful. I like that. Yeah, so that's my jig I use all the time. So that's my main my, my planing jig, and that handles the faces uh, of the of the boards. So what about the the ends and the edges? And yeah, those, I've got two other redneck jigs for that. Now this one's a little fancier, as you can see. It's uh, it's MDF and plywood. All right. So, yeah, I was getting fancy. It's so, diversity. It is. It's it diversity. So we got, here is my end grain shooting board. And it's also a sawing uh, uh, bench hook. So I will take a piece of wood and I'll saw it off to uh, the right length here on, on the bench hook side. And then I can just very quickly flip it over. And then with plane, I can uh, plane the end. And so, that works great, but this particular jig has a problem. And that problem is that it's not square right now. So I was checking it last night. It's taking my square. And if we look here, we can see it's out, right? I got light. Yeah, I got yeah. light. So it's, it's touching up here, and it's not touching out here at the corner, right? All right, so what, what do you have to see? do? Do you have to take it apart? And no, that's the beauty of redneck jigs. Is it's got about, you know, 100 nails in it. So uh, it's not gonna <laughs> it's not gonna go anywhere. I'm not gonna make an adjustable fence with a little micrometer or anything there. I'm just gonna nail the sucker down. All right. And so what we've got, the problem we've got here, Chuck, is that when we planed this, it was making it so that it was touching up here at the sole, right? Okay. So we'll pretend the sole was a square. 
So it was touching up here at this corner, and we have light at this corner. So we just arrange the board like that, and we know that that's what we need to do to make it square. We need to remove more up at this corner. Okay. So this now tells us exactly what I need to do. It means I need to take off some material on this side to bring the, the thing back into square. All right. Now the easy way to do that is to just grab a shoulder plane. You don't have to get a square out or, or do anything too fancy here, but you just take it and we're going to, we'll get that secured there so it doesn't move. And we just take and make a series of passes that looks like making a taper cut. Sure. So I start here at the corner, make a short cut, a little longer, a little longer. One final cut all the way. All right. And then we test our work. So we put it on here, put it back on there. And now we can hear it's taking more here. It's not getting it over here. Ah, yes. That's nice. Now yeah. we check our work. And tell me, is there any light there? Can you see light? No light. You're not I cannot lying? see the light. All right. Well, that's good then. So now this jig, this uh, shooting board, is completely square, which is it'll stay like that for a long time until you know maybe these nails come loose, and then it needs some more nails. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so that's what we do, and I have these in a wide variety of sizes, and they're also chopping boards. You know, when I'm chopping out dovetails, you can see this is all scarred up. So I don't get too precious about my jigs, and uh, but they do protect the bench. And, uh, and they are just, as you can see, scrap. I see. And you get two or three purposes out of one jig. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, it's real quick and easy and dirty to make. You know, you don't have to get precious about it. So That's great. And so there's one more I want to show you, and it's, it's this. Well, that, that doesn't thing. look good. Yeah, well, no, this is a great, this is one of my favorite jigs. It's a redneck jig. You've got to be kidding. It's a French redneck jig. Ah! Yeah. So let me show you... Uh, this is for doing long edges. And we'll go down here to the tail vise. And so this is a trick I picked up from a French book many years ago. And you know, when you're planing long edges, especially like on a really big board, really long board, it can be challenging to have that in your face vise. Sure. Try to balance the plane on the edge. So what the French do, and here, let's get this clamped up between dogs. So let's get that in there. So they'll just clamp the work to the bench, and they'll use the bench as a shooting board. So what this, this little, you know, my little redneck jig does is it holds the board off of the bench. Right. And then we can just use this as a long grain shooting board, as long as your bench top is flat. Sure. So now I can just shoot a perfect 90 degrees. That is... Wonderful. Voila. Yeah. Cute, cute. Voila. <laughs> so that is my uh, redneck long grain jig. I use this for doors, you know, uh, lids, right. almost any assembly, and as long as your bench top stays pretty flat, it's it's a piece of a uh, piece of uh, croissant. And I think I could even make these jigs. Uh, any redneck can. All right. Well, I qualify. Thank right, you man. so much. Thanks for having me, Chuck. Don't go away. For me, design is very much like raising kids. It grows, and it doesn't necessarily grow the way you think it's going to grow. You sure hope it turns out all right in the end, and you do your best to nurture it and bring it along properly. The impressive mind behind these beautiful designs, Jeff Miller, is coming up next. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. Masterpiece Wood Finish is a special three-part oil and wax system designed to enhance the beauty of wood. It's easy to apply, maintain, and repair. Applying several coats of the base coat, mid coat, and top coat to a prepared wood surface will create a finish that will make a craftsman smile. I helped develop Masterpiece Wood Finish, not just for your masterpiece, but mine too. Craig, from the first cut to the final assembly, providing woodworkers with products that help simplify woodworking challenges. Craig.
Introducing the ultimate blush trim rounder bit by Whiteside. Get CNC quality cuts from your patterns every time. Whiteside, industrial grade and American made. Rikon Power Tools, a leader in woodworking power tools for over 10 years with a passion for quality and performance at an affordable price. Rikon has a full line of dependable tools, including a long list of industry-leading bandsaws like their new powerful 10, 350, 14-inch professional. Rikon Power Tools, tools designed by woodworkers. If you can't make it to Atlanta, then you can always shop us on the web at www.highlandwoodworking.com. Moment with a Master is presented by Masterpiece Wood Finishes, helping you build beautiful furniture. Jeff Miller's furniture and books have always inspired me, from chair making and design to the foundations of better woodworking. But the story he told the Highland Woodworker is the most inspiring of all. There was this sense that I'm going to make this and I'm going to make it something that I like. And that has been a guiding principle in what I do ever since. And I've learned much, much more over the years and I've learned largely through failures of my own and the lack of willingness to accept that failure as where I'm going to be. Most days you'll find Jeff Miller here in his workshop. It sits hidden off of one of North Chicago's main streets. It was originally built to house a post office and later a bowling alley. Jeff has spared this old place where it now serves as his very own creative complex. His furniture is breathtaking. It's designed for form and function. Design is always such a fascinating part of this. To someone on the outside, it appears like you're, you're plucking this idea out of thin air and turning it into something. It, it seems like it's almost a magical process. And it's not. I mean, it's a lot of work. It's a process where you learn to look for solutions in what's around you and um, then work really hard to implement those and get it so that it works. Jeff has been making things work since his early childhood days in the Bronx. My grandparents had a store. It was a wholesale stationery store, card store, and toy store. And they would get back broken things. And my grandfather would set me up in the back room of the store with piles of broken stuff on the table. And it was my job to fix things. And it just got my brain working in that way. And so I started understanding how things went together and would pull out parts from one and put them into the other and started solving problems. And solving that kind of a problem really became part of who I was. As I got older, um, a friend of mine had a table saw and he offered to lend it to me. And I took it down in our basement and set things up and I started trying to make some things that were well beyond what I was capable of doing. But at the time I was a musician and I wanted to make a music stand. So I spent some time and fooled around with it and I knew nothing. I bought a doweling jig and I doweled together a music stand. And it was an interesting design and we still actually have it. I, I repurposed it as a dictionary stand, but that was my first woodworking project. Um, it's still in our dining room, it's pretty ugly, but I keep that as a reminder of where I started. I'm sure that music stand came in handy while Jeff was becoming classically trained on the trumpet. He graduated from Yale and traveled the globe as a musician. Later, while playing closer to home with the Chicago Chamber Music Group, he decided to rekindle an earlier interest in woodworking. Soon after picking up his hand tools and firing up the bandsaw, a doctor delivered a life-threatening diagnosis. As long as I've been woodworking, I've also had kidney disease. It actually is something that came up 
two or three months after I started trying to do this. And it certainly knocked me out. I was hospitalized as they figured out what was going on and wound up on some pretty intense medications as things started out, as they were trying to slow down the progress of this kidney disease. And it made the transition from music to woodworking in many ways happen because I had been fooling around with the woodworking, I had set up a shop, but I was also working musical jobs and then this came up and the medications that I was on made it almost impossible for me to perform. Any tension, any stress, which is basically every performance to some degree, um, the medications made me react very poorly to that stress and I couldn't cope with it. So I sort of retreated into just the woodworking and stopped playing um, and found as much satisfaction, if not more, in, in what I was doing. Over the years, um, my kidney has indeed failed and I got a transplant first in 1994. My son was then one years old and um, went through that process. Um, it went very well. But transplants, they don't necessarily tell you this up front, it's not a cure. It doesn't necessarily do anything. My condition was that my immune system was sort of hyperactive and that's what knocked out the kidneys originally. And that has meant that over the years the kidney transplant failed. Um, I got a second kidney from a friend in 2002. That was a, an amazing thing. He just sort of stepped forward and said, yeah, you can have one of mine. It was um, something I was nervous about up front. Do I want to be indebted to somebody for something like that? And it turned out to be such a, a wonderful thing because it meant so much to him to give this kidney that it, it wasn't like I felt indebted anymore. He had, he had already gotten the reward from it himself, and, but it engendered this incredible closeness between us and our, our kids started acting like they were cousins together and we would get together for Thanksgiving dinners and things like that. So it was a wonderful experience overall and he was just terrific about that. But unfortunately, again, they don't last forever. They rarely do. And so the second one has now failed for the most part. A little bit of function left, but I'm on dialysis. It's a, a miracle really of its own in that hooking myself up to a machine at night, every night, I can feel almost completely healthy and um, have almost as much energy as when I had one of these good kidneys in me. Today, Jeff is an avid runner, active cyclist, and of course, a world-class furniture maker and author. His latest book, The Foundations of Better Woodworking, demystifies and teaches techniques that every woodworker can use. The whole idea is that there are these things that people don't do as woodworkers and they don't understand. I have been teaching now for I think 17 years and the students come in and they have read everything. They've read all the magazines, they've read websites, they follow everybody's blogs, they watch everybody's videos and they don't know how to stand at a workbench. And they don't know how to hold the tools and they don't know how their body should work to use the tools efficiently or effectively even. And your stance is important, is that right? Well, this is very important for hand planing in general, is that your feet be spread apart and that the movement comes from your feet. That gives you the opportunity to control things with your hand. If you're pushing with your hands and your arms, it's very hard to also control with your hands and your arms. So I'm moving my whole body, and this gives me the opportunity to take these big long shavings, even though the only thing keeping that blade on the curve is my hands. 
and you're using your weight to transfer into exactly and that doesn't seem to tire you out as much as no. flailing away with your arms with your arms exactly yeah. i've seen you know these big muscular guys come in here and they're planing like this uh -huh. and they're ready to drop in in just a minute or two and this is something that you can keep doing for a long time because your lower body is very efficient. They're the strong muscles. Mm -hmm. And your elbows <coughs> are kind of tucked. They're not. They're in uh, close to your body most yeah. of the time. I, mm -hmm. I'm hardly ever with hand tools do I get further away from my body than, you know, maybe six, eight inches between my elbow and my hip. Wow. It's, it's always in fairly close. Then feel the surface here. You know, it starts out kind of lumpy and bumpy like a like fairly that. typical bands on surface. And this is just smooth and fair. That's nice, very nice. And also very quick. Yeah, downhill. Right. With Jeff, every project starts and ends with design in mind. For me, design is very much like raising kids in that you start out with, you know, a, a little seed of an idea and um, it grows, and it doesn't necessarily grow the way you think it's going to grow. You sure hope it turns out all right in the end, and you do your best to nurture it and bring it along properly. But you see where it turns out. I have a lot of fun in my design process, especially when I'm working with chairs. I start with something very basic to me, which is comfort in a chair. And I will prototype and come up with some sort of a, a very comfortable way to sit. And then from that, I can take off some very hard information and start to generate a visual design from that. And then from there comes figuring out the structure and figuring out what's going on. And uh, hopefully come up with something interesting in the end. So one day, about 20 years ago, I was playing around and I nailed together this sketch, really, of a back leg. And last year, somewhere in the middle of last summer, I sort of fully realized an idea for what this could be. And so I then got some pieces of quarter inch Baltic birch plywood and cut out. and put together this chair. While I was working on this though, I had a customer come to me who was very interested in a little, a solid wood kind of lounge chair or reading chair for his apartment. And so I, while we were talking, I went to the bandsaw and made a really crude sketch of what I had in mind for this. So what I did was I moved on to this prototype. And I think I got a little bit ahead of it myself. I had some walnut and I decided to glue it up. I thought, okay, this was where it was gonna go and this was gonna work out. And of course, it hasn't. It, this is an early prototype. This was a proof of concept. It both looks very interesting visually and it's very comfortable to sit in. And I started exploring the idea of putting the arms on it and I've cut off the legs and put different legs on as I goof around with shapes that are working better. And then from this, the actual shapings of the real chair started to come together. I can see that. that that's really exciting. So has there been another step? Well, the, the next step here is this one. As the arms are starting to come together and the full chair is coming into its own, really, um, obviously this has still got a ways to go. The shaping of the arms is in no way settled. Um, there may be more shaping to the seat. This is just, all of it is just dry fit together. There's nothing attached, flushed off. Um, and so the next step goes beyond this and that is just getting started over here. where the, the shaping of the walnut is coming together a little bit more. Now there's a refined edge. The edges aren't all just raw. And this has a long way to go too. 
um, there, there's a lot more to do with this. But it's starting to come together well, in a, a way. Well, it's a beautifully fared curve. I just love I it. spend a lot of time working on fairing curves and have some techniques that I've developed to get me there quicker and more easily. Jeff continues to lay the groundwork for many woodworkers today. Teaching, like furniture making, just comes natural to him, and he really takes it to heart. A large part of the legacy will be in students, in people who have built projects that I have written about in, in books and articles, um, people who have taken classes and who have learned from me. I, take great pride. I get emails all the time from people who've read this book or read this article and have made this particular piece of furniture. And it's like, it's like grandkids. They send pictures of the grandkids. It's the grand furniture. Um, and that gives me an enormous amount of pleasure. And I think that's definitely part of what my legacy will be. Woodworking communities have helped woodworkers develop their skills all over the world. Let's find out how Mark Spagnola's Wood Whisperer community might be just what you're looking for. The Wood Whisperer is an online woodworking community that offers education and entertainment for the modern woodworker. After starting the world's first woodworking video podcast in 2006, the fan base grew around the videos and blossomed into a full-fledged community. Need project inspiration? Check out what your fellow woodworkers are building in our extensive project gallery. Trying to improve your shop? Peruse over 100 shop tours of all shapes and sizes. And because every post has a comment section, you can quickly and easily get answers to your questions. If open discussion is more your thing, you'll want to check out our sister site, woodtalkonline.com. This modern, family-friendly forum has three basic rules. No politics, no religion, and no jerks. Join in the discussion with community members hailing from every continent. Check out the gallery and post your work for others to see. Enjoy our SketchUp library where you can download project plans. If you enjoy audio content, you don't want to miss Wood Talk. Every Wednesday, Mark, Matt, and Shannon record live and bring you the latest tips, tricks, and community happenings. Submit your questions and catch up on old episodes at woodtalkshow.com. The Wood Whisperer community is energetic and passionate about woodworking. There has never been a better time to learn, share, and build. We hope to see you there. If you'd like your woodworking society, community, or organization to be highlighted on the Highland Woodworker, then contact us at this email address and we'll tell you how. Improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of the Highland Woodworker, special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today. Thank you so much for watching the show. Don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And until next time, I'm Charles Brock and I'm a Highland Woodworker.